All right, hello all you crazy Chase Hokers. Uh, good to see you and those of you who are new and crazy enough to try this place out today. Uh, we're glad you're with us too. And that's true whatever campus you're at. I don't know which one of our campuses is craziest, whether it's you here at Legacy or uh, Sloan Creek or uh, 544, which is my neighborhood. Those are my homies over there. Uh, or those of you online uh, right now sitting in your PJs in your living room uh, watching there or you're podcasting later driving down the road. However you're with us, we're really glad that you're with us today. And, and one thing that's true of each of us is that we're all unique. Every one of us are a little bit different than everybody else on the planet, just like Mr. Rogers used to say uh, back in the day, we're all different, because we're all, God's creative. He doesn't use a photocopier. He makes us all, we're all custom made. We're all unique. But some of us in this room, whatever room you're in, whether it's your living room or your campus, some of us are more unique than others, right? There's people in this room that are a little more unique than others, and some of you know that because you're pointing to people right now. I see it. And uh, um, I'm sure because it's, they're so wonderful, you know, and, and that's what you're pointing to people for. Um, and some people in our culture are iconic because they're known for some things that are different. It's like their thing, their brand. It's what they're known for. It's their identifier. Uh, for example, Albert Einstein. I mean, we know, all, you know, we all know he's, he's really smart, but he's got that, cra- you know, had that crazy hair thing going. Would he look as smart if his hair had been more typical like that, you know? <laughs> I don't think so. Um, you know, there are people who are known for stuff, like, uh, like the Duck Dynasty guys. You know, without their beards, uh, let's go to the Duck Dynasty, That's, he's not one of them. Okay, yeah, the Duck Dynasty guys, um, without their beards, would, would we even care? Would there be a show, you know? <laughs> Yeah, Donald Trump. This is not a, uh, you know, like a political statement, you know, on the Donald Trump thing. Uh, but, you know, he definitely works that hair, right? That's his brand. He would, he would never change that, I don't think. Or here's another one that's a little bit unique, and that's Miley Cyrus. Uh, she's got that tongue thing going that she does. And, uh, and I'm not judging. I'm not making fun of her. She's a talented person, and, you know, she can do. But, she's, who, but nobody else does that, Right? Yeah, I don't see you doing that. Well, so actually, a couple of you are. But, um, but you know, that's, that's her thing, right? She's made that her thing. Um, or have you ever seen Bono without his sunglasses? You know, he always wears sunglasses no matter what. And, he, you know, Bono happens to be a Christ follower. So I've seen him in different settings with church leaders and other things that he's interacted with. And He's always got some kind of sunglasses on. I've never seen him without sunglasses, no matter how dark the room. But that's his thing. Or Spike Lee, his glasses, glasses, and his hat. Spike Lee can afford LASIK. You know, he he could fix his vision problems if he wanted to. But, But that'd be really foolish, at least if it caused him to stop wearing his glasses, glasses, because that's just part of who he is, right? They're known for this. This is their thing. It's their brand. It's their identifier. As Christians in culture, we are unique too, right, to, to the part of our culture who doesn't know Jesus, who doesn't claim to be a Christian, who doesn't follow Jesus. As, as Christians, we're unique. We're different than everybody else. But then you say, well, how are we different? Like, how do we stick out? Not just from what we would say, but from what people outside us looking in would say. What would our culture say that, oh, this is what Christians are. Christians are this, or evangelical Christians are this. And we really don't have to guess, because there's all these polls that have been taken over the last decade to answer that, of what non-church people, the words they use to say, oh, this is what Christians are like. And increasingly, people are very passionate to answer that, who are outside Christianity, and it hasn't been that positive. It's words like arrogant, uh, narrow-minded, bigoted, out-of-date, irrelevant, uh, you know, not self, self-serving, and all, all these kind of words that aren't exactly the best. Um, so we've got some work to do, which leads me to another question, and that is, what should be our differentiator? differentiator? What should be the thing that causes us to stand out that people who don't know Jesus, who don't know anything about Christians, if they said, hey, what are Christians about? What would be the thing that they would say should Oh, yeah, that. And we don't have to guess there either, not because of polls. 
in this case, but because our founder and Lord Jesus told us the differentiator, told us what people should think immediately, told us what should make us stand out. Now, some of you know what that is because you've been around church a long time or you've, you maybe it's the passage in John 13 we'll look at later that, um, you know, this is how people will know that you really are my disciples and then he says that and you're gonna get to show off in just a little bit and give your Bible answer and that'll be great. Okay, that'll be fine. But it's interesting to me, before we do that, what Jesus did not say. Because Jesus didn't say, hey, here's the big thing that people, it's about what, it's, it's what you believe. It's your beliefs. What we believe is really important, but that's not it. Or your morality, your unique way of life, that's important, but that's not what he said. Or the way you do family, the way you do marriage or sexuality and that kind of thing, that's it. But no, that's not it either. That's important and that's good, but that's not it. It's one word that should be our differentiator, our thing. And I'll let you say it. What is it? It's love. L-O-V-E, love. Now, the danger of that answer is we think we know what Jesus means. Like, oh, because we all know about love, right? I mean, we've, you know, I love this person, this person loved me. I've, you know, had broken loves. I have, you know, I'm looking for love. You know, we, we all know something about love. And so, therefore, it's easy to hear that and say, oh, yeah, so Jesus is saying, yeah, you got to be loving, nice. Christians are supposed to be nice and sweet and kind. You kind of pat them on the head, thank you, Jesus, and think we know what that means. But we don't. And what I want us to be open to is what Jesus was talking about was something way bigger, way crazier, way more radical than we think. So I want us to be really open to this because it's really important we as Christ followers get this. This is our thing. This is what we should be known for. So do you remember some, and I know a lot of you don't because you're you know, younger, but the foreigner song, I want to know what love is. Remember that? I want to know what love is. I want you to show me. You want me to keep going? Yeah. I mean, who needs worship leaders? I could just do all this, right? We don't need them. I'm, you know, obviously we do. Um, yeah, I, I want us to have that mentality. I want to know what love is. I want you to show me. Because what Jesus is talking about, a Jesus kind of crazy love, is what our world desperately needs to see from us. And it's really rare. And so let's look at the passage with fresh eyes and ears, uh, especially if you've heard it before. John 13 is where we're going to be. John 13 is in a, a, big, a bigger passage of Scripture, John 13, 14, 15, 16, these four chapters. That's one evening in the life of Jesus. So John, who wrote the book of John, was one of the disciples who were there. And this conversation is, is often called the La Last Supper, called the Last Supper because it was the last time he would spend with his disciples before he later goes and prays in the Garden of Gethsemane, and there's where Judas betrays him, and he's arrested that same evening and then crucified the next day. So this is the last time he's going to spend with his disciples before all that craziness happens, before the crucifixion. And it's a really impactful time. It's a very intimate time. It's so, it was so impactful to John, who was there, who wrote the book of John, you know, he devotes four chapters to this one conversation. That's roughly 20% of the book of John is just this one conversation. As he covers the whole life of Jesus, he gives 20% to just this one conversation because it was so impactful. It was so impactful to John that later, decades later, when he writes his letters to churches, 1 John, 2 John, 3 John, he refers back to this evening and the themes of this evening over and over again. It was an it's an incredible passage of Scripture. And so let's kind of eavesdrop and hear what Jesus said. Verse 33 is where we'll start. Dear children, I'll be with you only a little longer. And as I told the Jewish leaders, you will search for me. But you can't come where I'm going. He's talking about his arrest and his crucifixion and even death. And he's saying, well, what I'm about to go through, you can't go with me. You can't follow me there. So it's going to be a little while the last time again it's like his last words before his arrest and then death the next day and when somebody's sharing their last words before their death that's pretty dramatic right everybody leans in just like the movies you know when, when somebody's there and he's you know they're about to die and and they say tell my wife I love her and everybody's leaning in or the treasure map is in my uh you know you're like, ah you know right 
Everybody leans in. It's a dramatic moment. Well, Jesus makes this even more dramatic because he announces, before he just shares the command, he announces it. Verse 34, so now I'm giving you a new commandment. And the way that he words it makes it even more dramatic. For one, in the original language of the Bible, Greek, he puts new commandment up at the very beginning of the sentence, which is their way of like pushing, uh, putting flashing, you know, lights, strobe lights around it, ding, 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 new commandment. And the word he uses for new is really a, an unusual word for new too. It wasn't their typical word for new. Greek is more precise than English in its vocabulary. And this one meant like novel, never before seen, out of this world kind of thing. So there, it's like drum roll. You can hear it. Man, this is going to be incredible. What is it? What in the world has Jesus never told us to do that now he's telling us to do? And this is going to be our thing, our difference. I mean, what is it? And then he's, let's look at it. So now I'm giving you a new commandment. Drum roll. Love each other. Just as I have loved you, you should love each other. Your love for one another will prove to the world that you are my disciples. The big, new, never, anybody's never heard this thing. Love each other. And you know what happened 2,000 years ago at that dinner? That fell flat. It, it, it was like, it, if it were a movie today, it'd be love each other, and it'd be wah, 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 you know, kind of a thing. Where people, it's just like, okay, nice. Thank you very much. That's sweet. And we know it felt was that way because what happens next, Peter ignores it. Jesus wants to teach this. He, this is the point of the dinner for him. But Peter's like, um, hey, that's great, Jesus. Yeah, love one another. That's brilliant, good. But what about this? You're going somewhere. We can't follow you. And I don't, you know, can we talk about that? And, and that's what, and Jesus has to talk about that for the next couple chapters and then returns in John 15 to the new commandment, to what he wants to talk about because they miss the newness and the bigness of the new commandment. Why? For the same reason we can, because we think he knows what he, what we, you know, we think we've heard it. I mean, what's new about the new command? Love each other? That's not new. The Old Testament told us to love each other. Leviticus 19, for example, love your neighbor. And, you know, and Jesus picks up on that in his teaching when people, you know, somebody asks him, what's the point of the Old Testament law and, and religion? And Jesus says, well, it's really two things, love God and love each other. I mean, this, this was not new to kind of love each other. Wow, I've never heard of that before. Or he even gave the golden rule, you know, to treat other people the way you'd want to be treated as an expression of love. Jesus also was, did do something new, and that is he said, hey, you've heard it said to love each other. That's cool. It's good. But I'm saying you need to love not just each other, but you need to even love your enemies, those who hate you and are persecuting you and revile you. You love them and everybody in between, those that love you and those that hate you, you love them all. That's new, that's novel, but love each other? Like, what's new about that? But you have to hear everything he said to hear what's new about that, because it's crazy what he said. He said, just as I have loved you, you should love each other. Now that's different. Like when he returns to it in John 15, 13, this is my commandment, Love each other in the same way I have loved you. That's what's new. Love in the way I love. There's no greater love than to lay down one's life for one's friends, which, of course, Jesus will do. It's a crazy kind of Jesus love. It's not just the golden rule, do unto other people as you would have them do to you. That's hard. That's big. But this is bigger. This is like the platinum rule, the, the diamond rule. It's you love, not just the way you would want to be loved or the way you would treat yourself. You love the way I would. That's a way higher bar. Now, they just got a picture of what that looked like in this meal in John 13, because before John 13, 33, in John 13, 34, where he gives the new commandment, the first thing he does at this dinner, at this time with him, is he washes their feet. Now, for us, culturally, like, well, that's kind of weird, you know, like if you came over to my house and I said, hey, take off your shoes, I'm gonna wash your feet. You'd be like, dude, <laughs> creep, weirdo. I knew this church was great. I'm get out of here, right? Because we don't do that. But they, they did that because they wore sandals in dirty places. And Jerusalem and, and urban centers were really dirty, filthy places back then, 2,000 years ago. Because like, for example, sanitation. They didn't, you didn't go to the bathroom and flush the toilet and it went mysteriously somewhere. It, 
you, you did your thing, and, and eventually you had to do something with it, and you would pour your treasures out in the street, out of your window. And so this mud in the streets had some mud in it, but it had some other interesting things in it too, and that's just the way it was. And it was dirty, filthy, you walked around in sandals. So when you went into somebody's home, washing feet was a good thing to do, an important thing to do. And you know you were the servant at the lowest end of the servant totem pole if that's your job. Because I was the lowest of the low to wash the filth off of people's feet. In the beginning of this meal, that's what Jesus does. He takes off his outer cloak so he doesn't get it stained and and dirty by the interesting dirt and filth, and he washes their feet. And they're uncomfortable because they know, hey, you're like God. I mean, we're just finally figuring out you're you're God in human flesh. You're our creator. You know, you can't do this. We'll do this. No, you can't do this. And he said, no, you, you you gotta let me do this. And not only that, this is the way I want you to relate to people. This is our thing. We roll up our sleeves, we make ourselves uncomfortable, we sacrifice, we humble ourselves for the sake of others. That's our thing, that's what we do. Jesus is gonna give even a bigger display than foot washing in just a few hours as he is gonna lay down his life for his friends. As he's going to go to the cross and give his life. And that's what God calls us to, to live a life that way as as Jesus says, Later, or John, well, yeah, Jesus says in the book of John later, for the Son of Man has not come to be served, but to serve and give his life as a ransom for many. That's what Jesus calls us to, a life that says it's not about me. I'm here not to be served. It's not about my preferences and my, what I, my comfort. I, give, I don't care about that. What fuels me is to serve and to give my life away for others. Paul picks up on that. In Philippians 2, it's it's a crazy way to live life, as we're going to see. It's like nobody lives like this because human nature is self-centered. This is saying, no, we're not like that. We're totally different from that. Philippians 2, Paul says, do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Selfish ambition is just for your benefit of yourself. So how much of our life should be spent on benefiting ourselves? None. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interest, but each of you to the interest of others. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus. And then he goes on and says, love like Jesus loved. What did he do? He left heaven for earth, came to this sinful, broken planet, gave his life away. That's the model. That's what we're to do. And that sounds easy in church to say, oh, okay, I get it. That's what we do. We serve and we... but. It's what Jesus, what Jesus is talking about, what Paul picks up on is way more radical than that, way crazier than that. Really rare. So rare, even 2,000 years ago when Paul was at, in Philippians chapter 2, he refers back to it in verse 19. This is how rare it is. I hope in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you, the Philippian church, soon. Timothy was one of the people on his team. That I also having problems with my Bible, also may be cheered when I receive news about you. I have no one else like him who will show genuine concern for your welfare, for everyone else looks out for their own interests, not those of Jesus Christ. Who's he talking about? A bunch of bad people? No. He's talking about his team. I mean, his, his pastor team, his missionary team, people like Titus and Silas and Aristarchus and Epaphras, wonderful people. And imagine being on that team and you read Philippians, it even gets put in the Bible like forever. I've only got one person on my team, his name is Timothy, that really gets this Jesus crazy kind of love thing. I mean, they're all great and doing, but he's the only one who really gets it. And I'm sending him to you, Philippi, Because I want you to be encouraged, and I know what he'll do. He'll go crazy over you. That's what I want. That's how rare this is. And why is it so rare? I mean, it should be normal for us, but why is it so rare? Because it's against sinful nature that's built around ourself. It's it's hard to love with a Jesus kind of love. Even with people who love us and that we have great affection for, it's hard. Like what Paul says in Ephesians 5, where he says, husbands, those of you who are husbands, and some of you here are husbands, right? 
<laughs> you, you are. And uh, um, some of you maybe want to be husbands or not, I don't know. But if you're a husband, you've got a job description. And your job description in Ephesians 5 is, to, is pretty simple to understand. Just, just love your wife the same way Jesus loves you as his church, as a believer. All you gotta do is love your wife with the same kind of sacrifice and crazy love that Jesus loves you with and you get, you, you're done. That's pretty, pretty high bar, right? He just applies the platinum rule to marriage. So for me, example, I'm married to Christy. And if you know Christy and you hear me talk about this, you'd say, Jeff, you got it easy, man. I mean, she's easy to love. She's a wonderful person. She's loving, she's kind, she accepts everybody. I mean, she's just, there's nobody easier to love. You, man, you, you, you got it made. And that's true. Except, <laughs> she's hard to love that way. Even though I love her a lot. I mean, I have great affection for her. In our culture, we think of love as a feeling. Oh, I've fallen in love or fell out of love. In the Bible, that's not what love is. That's a romantic feeling. And that's God-given and it's good. And, and there's a whole book in the Bible to help us cultivate that. There's Song of Solomon. It's not a bad thing. Romance, God gave us that. It's something to be enjoyed. But that's not love. Love does. It doesn't just feel, whether it feels or not. But with, so with Christy, there are times I have to, I mean, it's just not easy. I mean, when I'm hurt, it's not easy to work through conflict in a godly way. I want to hurt back or be, you know, if, you know, if she, if I know something that would be really helpful, but it great, be great sacrifice to me, sometimes that's a little easier than sometimes not. Especially if I feel like she's not loving me the way I want to be loved, then I'm not going to love her that way. I'm not going to do that. Or just bow her. Or, um, you know, her love language I know what it is. You know how there's those different love languages? Hers is acts of service, which is like the worst one to me. <laughs> you know, I mean, I just, I wish it were, was like golf. <laughs> That'd be good. Or, uh, um, or physical affection is one of the love languages. That would be great. <laughs> Sex would be even better, but I didn't say that out loud. I just thought it, so don't get <laughs> offended by that. But... Um, but, you know, I mean, something like physical affection, that'd be, like, easy, but acts of service, I mean, all, you know, doing all this, I mean, ugh. <laughs> yeah. Sometimes it's really hard to do, but I know, right? So, so all, all the, I do have a point here. <laughs> that is that, that even with somebody I have great affection for that's easy to love, it is really hard to do the platinum rule. Really hard. But Jesus says, hey, it's not just people that love you, that you love, that are easy to love, that you have great affection for. It's your enemy and everybody in between. You love with this crazy kind of love, not even thinking about yourself. And that's not easy. In fact, that's really hard. I'm gonna give a little lyrics test, see how you do. This is song lyrics from 10 years ago, okay? What's cooler than cool? Ice cold. Ice cold. Let me try that again. What's cooler than cool? Ice cold, okay. Now, this is not a song lyric, but what's harder than hard? Impossible. And Jesus is gonna say, loving the Jesus kind of crazy love, the way Christians are supposed to do, is impossible. Without Jesus. That's why it's unique to Jesus followers. Because it can only be sourced in Jesus. It can only come from Jesus. But if we, what Jesus is gonna say is, if we're connected to him, it will happen. When he returns to John, when he returns to, in John 15 to what he wanted to talk about until he got interrupted by Peter to love each other in the golden rule, he talks about that. John 15, five, he uses the illustration of the vine and the branches. He said, yes, I am the vine, the one that gives life and energy and nutrition. You are the branches. Those who remain in me and I in them will produce much fruit. What's the fruit in the context? Crazy love. This is what will happen. If you're connected to me in a vital way, you'll do this crazy love thing. It's the only way you can, and you will. For apart from me, you can do nothing. You can't do this on your own. John 15, 9, he says, I have loved you even as the Father, God, has loved me. 
remain in my love or abide in my love. He's saying, if you abide in my love, you're swimming in my love, my love is filling you up and you're connected to me, then that love is gonna spill over and you're gonna produce this fruit. And it's the only way you can. Now, this is fruit here, obviously, right? Grapes. And, and fruit, the whole process, it, it, maybe because I didn't grow up in a farming family or maybe if I did, I'd be even more amazed. But I'm just, I'm amazed by like plants that grow fruit. Like how did, like we have great, you know, vines and our, they don't produce quite like this. But you, you know, you look and you think, how does that, how does that do that? Like how does that plant make this? But everything in that plant is designed to do this. And a healthy plant will do this. And that's what Jesus is saying is, this is what'll happen if you're vitally connected to me. You will bear fruit. You'll do this crazy love thing. That's what happens. And you can't do it without me. But if you're connected to me, this will happen. Now, here's one of the ways that's important to me, is I know that when I'm having a hard time loving people well and sacrificially, I have a connection problem. Because this is what the plant's designed to produce. This is what connection with Jesus is designed to produce. It's kind of like my, my car. You know, cars now have little computer things and, and they tell you information. And you can set it to tell you different things. And I like to keep my little trip computer on the thing that says miles till empty. I'm fascinated by it. I don't know why, but I am. So when I fill up, it usually says 386 miles till empty. And I feel like a champ. I can drive to Memphis almost and get barbecue. 386 miles. But I'm more fascinated than that with like four miles till empty. Two miles till empty. Anybody else play with this? One mile till empty. You see how far can I go? And I wish mine were a little more precise. It would say like after, because it just stops at a mile. If it said, you know, like, it's like get gas dummy or something or, or even like 20 feet till empty or 40 feet till empty, that would be... That'd be kind of interesting, but it doesn't. I know I'm empty, Jesus empty, when I have a love problem. When I find myself more excited about consumption, the next new thing, than I am about generosity, I've got a Jesus connection problem. When I find it hard to, to love people that love me in a sacrificial way, and and they hurt me, and I just want to, you know, do the unhealthy stuff, I know I've got a Jesus connection problem. When I have a hard time loving people who don't love me, that scare me. I mean, there's some cultures that are like, oh, I don't know how to deal with people. If, when I have a hard time pushing through that and loving people, I've got a Jesus connection problem. I'm empty. So what do you do when you have a Jesus connection problem? The same thing you do when you're one mile till empty. What do you do? You fill up. You spend time with Jesus. You make sure you're vitally connected to the vine. For us as a church, that's why we invest in vertical, vertical devotion. You can find it on our app online. You can do other things, but we just invest in that because we want people spending time with Jesus in the Bible and prayer. Just It's why we come together in small groups like life groups and other kinds of recovery groups and other kinds of small groups we have around here, why we're built around that, to have a vital connection with other people who, are, who will help us in our connection with Jesus. It's why we come in these big rooms like this and gather together every week to hear from, it's about Jesus' connection. And, and I know if I've got a love problem, I've got a Jesus' connection problem, because that's what it produces. But that's good news, because I know if I've got that problem, I say, okay, Jesus, I got connection problem, I need you because it's hard for me to give this way, love this way. But if we do, here's what happens, and Jesus tells us what happens, the result. Verse 35, your love for one another will prove to the world that you are my disciples. If you do this, it will prove to the world that you are my disciples. Meaning, in the big context of things, that you don't serve, you're not disciples of some dead Messiah, you're disciples of a living Jesus who rose from the dead and is alive today. And that's a pretty crazy thing to people to believe in. But the way people will know that that's real is if you love each other in this crazy kind of love. That's how people will know. That's your thing. That's your differentiator. You don't have to do your tongue a funny way. You don't have to wear glasses. You don't have to do, but this is your thing. John 17, in that prayer before his arrest, after the dinner, he prays for you and me. If you're a believer in Jesus, verse 20, 
He says, I'm praying not only for these disciples that were with him, the 11, because Judas was gone, but also for all who will ever believe in me through their message. Who's that? That's you and me, if you believe. I don't know if some of you don't at this point, but that's most of us in this room. I pray that they will all be one. This is the one thing he prayed for us when he was on earth. I pray that they will all be one, unified, just as you and I are one, as you are in me, Father, and I am in you, and they may be in us, so the world may believe you sent me. How's the world gonna believe that God came here, took on human flesh, died for our sin? That's a lot to take in. And Jesus puts all of it on, this is how the world will know. This group of crazy love called church that loves the world and loves each other in such crazy ways that are so unified, even though we're so different. I mean, look around the room. We're so different. We have different, we come from different backgrounds, different stories, different ethnicities, different cultures, different generations. And and especially in a culture like this one where we can't even disagree and still relate to people in a civil way, it gives opportunity for Christians to stick out even more. Because the church should be one place on this planet that you can disagree about a lot of things. But because of our commitment to the one thing, and that's Jesus, we love each other, and we honor each other, and we're together, even though we're really different. And, and, and when church is like that, a watching world says, wow, look at those people. They figure it out. They get along. That's come as you are. We talk about be transformed, too. And, and what is transformation? It's really about Jesus changing us from being self-focused to other focused, from being consumers to being just generous people in every way so that we can then together make a difference. And if we do that and we, make a di- and we love that way, what'll happen, what Jesus is saying is the world will know, meaning we gain legitimacy. People will be interested in what we believe in the way of Jesus, not because of us saying it loud, but because of our love displayed to each other and our love displayed, it's what gives us legitimacy. You know, this series is called, and this campaign is Together like together. Some of us, if you were a child of the 80s, thought we were really cool about legitimacy. MC Hammer, too legit to quit. Now, I know some of you are like, wow, I'm glad I'm too young to remember that. (laughs) But uh, but let's try it anyway, okay? Um, You just do two, the L, legit to quit. Try it, I can see you. Come on, you're just... (laughs) And I know at the campuses you're thinking, no, you can't, but do it anyway, okay? Too legit to quit. One more time, that was a week. Too legit to quit. Isn't that cool? Don't you feel cool? Buy parachute pants today. Be like MC Hammer. Okay, too legit to quit. What gives us legitimacy, too legit to quit, is what we're talking about. It's crazy love. And that's important because you and I live in a culture where we as Christians have lost legitimacy. People don't care what we have to say. They don't care about truth from our perspective. I mean, I'm not saying, I know there there are people who do in their pockets and all that, but in general, when you look at the polls, that's why they use words like arrogant and bigoted and narrow-minded. And 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 we can respond by saying, that's not fair. And you need to listen because I'm right. And you can talk louder, get mad at them. But that's not gonna be helpful. What's helpful is to do what Jesus said. The way we gain legitimacy is crazy love for each other in these crazy diverse communities called church that then pour that love, abide in the love of Jesus so much that it pours out on our community. It pours out on need in ways that a watching world looks and says, who else, who does that? Those people are crazy what they do. I mean, yeah, we're kind of into changing the world, but these people are over, they're nuts. They're over the top. When that's happened in church history, it's incredibly effective. In fact, the greatest example of that is the early church. As I said last week at Easter, that from a human perspective, the church should have died when Jesus died. Because there were a lot of messianic movements with messiahs who were killed and that was it. But Christianity didn't die. It, in fact, became like the dominant force in the Western world in a very short time. It like won the world over. And we know, well, Jesus rose from the dead and that's why and, you know, and then, but historians who, secular historians who look at, it's a real mystery because if you don't believe in the resurrection especially, and they're like, how did this happen? 
And the one thing that everybody can agree on that it was maybe the most important factor is crazy love. Because nobody loved that way until Christians came on the scene and they loved in a crazy love kind of way because in the Roman Empire, charity was considered a vice, not a virtue. You were, to, you were to allow weak people to die off. You didn't enable weakness. You just allowed that to die off for the strength of the empire. Christians said, uh-uh, forget that. We're here for them. And so they went right into weakness, right into need, right into injustice, they, right into uh, people crying out for help. That's what they did. And they did it so well, loving each other and other people, that a watching world looked on, even, and, and Christianity won people over, even though all odds were against it. I mean, the whole Roman Empire was trying to stamp out Christianity because emperors hated Christians. And as Christians began to spread, they hated Christianity. The reason the Caesars, the emperors, hated Christianity is because they were a culture built around emperor worship. The emperor was one of the gods, and Christians didn't worship the emperor. They obeyed the emperor as a representative of God, but they didn't worship the emperor. And that's a problem if you're an emperor. So they wanted it stamped out, and they did lots of really bad stuff to stamp it out. And I won't get detailed because it's ugly what they did to Christians, like really ugly what they did. It was hard. I mean, not just hard to be a Christian. It was like crazy hard to be a Christian because of all the crazy things that happened to Christians. But Christianity won the world over anyway. Why? Why? Because of crazy love. In fact, one of those Caesars in the, you know, 1800 years ago was named Julian. And he's frustrated because emperor worship is dying off, Christianity's growing, so he writes to one of his priests of the emperor worship thing, the Roman God thing, saying, what is the deal? What are we going to do? All these people are becoming Christians, and why come they're leaving us? And here's what he says in that letter from like 1800 years ago. It's cool that we have it. I think that when the poor happen to be neglected and overlooked by the priests, the impious Galileans, that's what he calls Christians, impious, irreligious, because they didn't believe in the Roman gods and didn't worship the emperor, so irreligious. Galileans, because Jesus was from Galilee, which was considered like a backwater, like I'm from Alabama, okay? So he's like saying, these irreligious Alabamans (laughs) observed this and devoted themselves to benevolence. The impious Galileans, the irreligious Alabamans, support not only their own poor, but ours as well. Everyone can see that our people lack aid from us. He's saying, maybe we should, like, be nice to poor people. (laughs) Maybe we should care about people. Tertullian, who was one of the church leaders at the time, said it this way from his side of it. He said, it is our care of the helpless, our practice of loving kindness that brands us in the eyes of many of our opponents. Only look, they say, Look how they love each other. That's what won the world over is crazy love. And Christians did love in crazy ways. And that's what God calls us to. That's our thing. That's, that, that's what sets us apart is sacrificial crazy love. Creating come as you are environments where we're transformed enough that we want to give our lives away for others and make a difference in this world. That's what God is up to in our church. That's what he's always working. As we're connected to Jesus, that's the fruit of a church is Crazy love. That's what you should expect to see on the community. And increasingly, that's what God's doing in our church and in our lives. We just want to keep taking steps that direction. And that's what this series is about and this campaign is about. The make a difference together thing, we're going to talk about, well, how do we actually do this? And what does this look like? And how can we engage need? How can we talk to people who disagree with us? And increasingly, a culture like, you guys are nuts. And how can we engage in a way that's, that's actually helpful? And we'll talk about that. We're not just going to talk. We're going to do something. And that's the campaign part. So here's what we're going to do over the next few weeks, basically the month of April. And, I, and, and I'm, we're, we need 100% participation to pull, off, to pull this off. 100% means... Just about everybody? Okay. Now, that means everybody. Like, I just came here for the first time. Leave me alone. No, you're in. Okay, so 100%. So it's, and here it is. It's 2 2 22. You can remember that, okay? 2 2 22. During this month, and you can sign up for this online and be, say, I want to be part of the 2 2 22. Um, two hours of serving in the month of April. Okay? Now, if you're in a life group, that should already be taken care of for you. Just show up to your life group thing. If your life group's not doing that, call me. I'll call your leader, and we'll have a little conversation to say, hey, what's going on? But anyway, so that's two hours of serving. Um, two bags of food um, that, to fill up our food banks. That'll be later, so we don't have to worry about that quite yet. And a $22 gift. That's per person. 
like $22 a person. So if you're a couple, that's how much? Okay, that took so long at 9 o'clock to get there. That's right, $44, okay? Um, $22 a person. Now, you look at that and you think, wait a minute, how's that going to change our community? You know, we're going to give $22 to our partners. There's five partners we're going to give $22 to. Uh, We're going to give two bags of food. That's not going to do a whole lot. And by itself, it won't. But multiply that times 4,000 or 5,000 people or 6,000 people or however many people participate. And all of a sudden, it gets interesting. I mean, if it's 5,000, well, that's 10,000 hours of serving. What could God do through that? That's 10,000 bags of food to fill up our food banks, to feed 10,000 people for a week as well. That's over $100,000 that we can give to our partners. And we've chosen five partners. You'll hear more about them in the weeks to come. But today, I want to focus on the $22 because we need to give that today or this week or next week. And the reason is because in three, not this next Sunday, but the next one, our partners will be here at the campuses and we'll give those gifts. And we want to be able to give those gifts. So, and our goal is to get to $100,000. That means $22 a person, 100% participation to make that happen. Think, how did you come up with $22? Came up with $22 because we think most people could do $22. I know some are in a situation like, no, I can't right now. And that's okay. Just do what you can do. But most people, most of us, blow $22 pretty regularly, like lunch today. Or you've taken somebody to a movie that was kind of a stupid movie, and you spent more than $22. Okay, so $22 is pretty, but together, this can make a huge difference, right? And uh, so in, in the, your host will tell you how to give and how you can accomplish that today or this week or next week. Um, to make our numbers work, some of you have the ability to give way more than $22, and we need you to. Uh, I mean, for Christy and me, we can give more than $22 a person, and we will give significantly more than $22 a person just because we'll pray about it. We want to do that, and we'll, you know, that's what we'll do, and that will make the number work because we'd love to surprise the, the partners with way more than even our plan. It's an ambitious plan, but we want to go beyond that, and so pray about what that is and give that, and we'll be able to bless people because that's just what we do. And if we do what we do, what Jesus followers do, we gain legitimacy. And in a culture where we've lost it, whether that's fair or not or whatever, in a culture where we've lost legitimacy, we have the opportunity to regain it. And honestly, in this community, that's happening. Because of what you do already, we have a lot of legitimacy here in this area, locally as a church. There's a whole lot more. We got a long way to go. A lot of, I mean, we're, we're not at the Jesus kind of crazy level. I mean, that's, but we're on our way. And so let's continue to keep taking steps that direction. Let's uh, bow our heads together. Father, I thank you for what you're doing in our lives and in our church. I thank you that you love us with crazy love to begin with. And you tell us, okay, now go love people that way. And we can't do that without you. So, Father, we ask that you would connect us to your life, that you would fill us with your love, and that that love would pour out, not only in the church for each other, but pour outside this church to a world that wonders if there's a God who cares, and we get to be the answer to that question, and help us be a good answer. In the name of Jesus, amen.